Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Mark Martin. Democrats were hoping for a victory last night in Georgia, where candidates have been fighting over the seat of former Congressman Tom Price, the new Health and Human Services Secretary. Instead, their hopes fell short, and the election is now headed for a runoff. Heather Sells has the story. Both parties see the seat held by former Congressman Tom Price as a test, an early indicator of what lies ahead in the 2018 congressional midterm elections. And Democrats are trying to make it a referendum on the president. When president Trump embarrasses our country or acts recklessly, I'll hold him accountable. Democratic candidate John Ossoff was up against 11 Republican candidates last night, but failed to get the necessary 50% of the vote to avoid a runoff election. That pits him against top vote getter Karen Handel in June. Ossoff is a former congressional staffer and Handel a former Georgia Secretary of State. She's also a former executive for the Susan Komen organization that fights breast cancer and she took political heat in 2012 for a decision to stop funding Planned Parenthood. This was a premeditated, orchestrated attack on a breast cancer organization. She told CBN News that Komen was looking for neutral ground and noticed that Planned Parenthood didn't perform mammograms, but merely referred them out. Last night, Handel told a Georgia crowd that she'll fight for their values, including those on health care. And she clearly tied her opponent to the National Democratic Party. It's a choice between the views and values of a proven, independent, and conservative leader who has delivered for the people of this district and this state. Or a Democrat who Nancy Pelosi hopes is going to deliver for her. Ossoff will no doubt try to capitalize on anti-Trump energy among Democrats while appealing to moderate Republicans in the conservative district. Let's show what people power is all about. But the president himself is clearly up for the fight, tweeting overnight about a big R win and saying glad to be of help. Heather Sells, CBN News. A gunman killed three men in Fresno, California after targeting them because they were white. Corey Ali Mohammed was caught on foot by police after the shootings and yelled Allahu Akbar when he was arrested. Police are calling it a hate crime. Mohammed already showed signs of violent aggression on social media. He called white people devils and released a rap album containing violent, explicit, racially charged lyrics. He is also the suspect in the murder of a motel clerk last week who was also a white man. The Trump administration says Iran is in compliance with the 2015 nuclear deal which former President Barack Obama negotiated. The Trump administration notified Congress of the deal and is continuing the sanctions relief given to Iran in exchange for restraints on its atomic program. But Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said in a letter, the administration is reviewing the agreement to decide if continuing sanctions is best for the United States. Tillerson said Iran is still a primary state sponsor of terrorism and President Donald Trump ordered the review, taking that into consideration. President Trump signed a new order in Wisconsin, the Buy American and Hire American initiative, focusing on how the government does business. White House correspondent Jennifer Wishon has the story. Buy American products and hire American workers. President Donald Trump thinks that's just good policy. After touring tool manufacturer Snap-on in Wisconsin, the president signed an executive order that does several things. First, it makes changes to the nation's H-1B visa or guest worker program. Instead of allowing the market to be flooded with low-wage foreign workers that eliminate jobs and drive down wages for Americans, his order requires visas be awarded only to the most skilled or highest paid applicants. No one can compete with American workers when they are given a fair and level playing field. Secondly, the order requires federal agencies to buy American products. Buy American laws have been on the books for more than 80 years, but they've been watered down through the use of waivers and loopholes, in some cases to appease other countries. And the net result is that we've seen a lot of opportunities foregone for factory workers in the United States to provide the steel for our bridges or the construction materials for our schools. Uh, 
or the armor plate for our uh, military equipment because of what is sometimes state sub subsidized competition from overseas. The Alliance for American Manufacturing reports that if Americans would spend just $64 a year on American made goods or contractors increase their use of American goods by just 5%, that would create 200,000 jobs. New ships, bridges, tunnels and airplanes will be constructed with American hands, American steel and yes, American tools. The push to buy American goods and hire American workers is extremely popular across the political spectrum. Republicans, Democrats, independents. And by keeping his promises to those blue collar workers who helped catapult him into the White House, Trump is potentially growing the base of the Republican Party. The big question, will buying American products increase costs? Scott Paul says no. You know, a Chinese part might cost uh, a little bit less than an American part, it's worth buying the American part because that, that money is going to be reinvested in our economy and we're going to have more opportunities to create jobs that way. You have uh, obviously better oversight, uh, you may have better quality, uh, but there's also that return to their economy that you don't get when those tax dollars leak overseas. The executive order requires agencies to review their buying practices, so look for changes towards the end of the year. American manufacturers hope it's done in time for the president's big infrastructure package. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Former President George H.W. Bush is recovering from what a spokesman says is a mild case of pneumonia that has been treated and resolved. Family members say a lingering and persistent cough was keeping him from resting. Bush has been in Houston's Methodist Hospital since Friday. He's reported to be in good spirits and is just being held for observation while he regains strength. He will be 93 in June. The minority Christian governor of Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, lost his re-election bid to his Muslim opponent. Former cabinet minister Anis Baswedan won the office with between 55 and 60 percent of the votes, with more than half the returns counted. The outcome of the race highlighted the country's religious and racial divides. The incumbent governor Basuki Pernama is currently on trial for blasphemy, and many of the Muslims in Jakarta want him to be imprisoned or even killed. Coming up, five former Soviet republics where the only safe place to talk about Jesus is the workplace. See how young Christian professionals in Central Asia are sharing the gospel. The growth of radical Islam helped make 2016 one of the worst years ever for Christian persecution. Christians in a predominantly Muslim region of Central Asia continue to face almost daily harassment for sharing the gospel. Even so, many young professionals in the five so-called Stan states are boldly spreading the gospel. George Thomas brings us that story from Kyrgyzstan. A Christian living in any of the five former Soviet republics of Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan or Turkmenistan can expect intimidation, harassment or worse, jail time for telling others about their faith. Artur, not his real name, is from Uzbekistan. I am called to be a witness for Christ, but that has been a dangerous calling. Maxim lives in northern Tajikistan. When the authorities discover someone has converted to Christianity, they will gather relatives, friends and family of the accused and bring him or her before an Islamic council of elders. The convert then stands before the group and has to decide between faith or family. 25 years after the Soviet Union disappeared and these republics gained their independence, the five so-called stand states have become repressive and hostile towards people of faith. In recent years, Christians have come under intense pressure here in Central Asia. In fact, in an attempt to crack down on radical Islam, these five governments have enacted laws curbing their activities. But here's the problem. Instead of going after Muslims, 
These governments are using these laws to go after Christians. Dr. Michael Cherenkov follows religious freedom issues in the former Soviet Union. These laws have forced Christians to be more creative and invent new approaches to sharing the gospel. Cherenkov says while churches and Christian organizations raise suspicion, individual relationships go virtually unnoticed. We are discovering that being a witness for Christ in the workplace is probably the only safe and effective form of evangelization. On a recent Saturday morning, hundreds of young Christians from across the region met for the first ever Next Generation Professional Leaders Initiative. The event was the brainchild and dream of Sergei Rakuba. It is not possible to overstate the significance of the gathering. He grew up in the former Soviet Union and remembers what it was like as a young Christian trying to discover his purpose in life. I was not allowed to study in the universities because I was a Christian. And throughout the whole territory of the Soviet Union, you could not find even one Christian professor, Christian doctor or Christian lawyer. Even the word business was a foreign word for Christians at that time. Rakuba brought together entrepreneurs, doctors, educators, lawyers and media experts to teach young professionals how to be effective witnesses for Christ in the marketplace. This is a generation that didn't grow up in a secular and repressive Soviet mindset. So they have a unique perspective, unique gifts and talents that can bring transformation to their communities. 31-year-old Urmat works as an IT specialist from Kyrgyzstan. While it's not always easy to talk openly about faith, I'm learning that my deeds should speak louder than my words and that building long-term relationships is vital. 17-year-old Miriam teaches English in Kazakhstan. My parents and all my relatives are against me because I'm a Christian. She says meeting others who have also endured much for their faith and still want to be used by God was a huge encouragement. This gathering is also important because it's teaching us how to safely combine our profession with our passion for Christ. Evgeny is a media specialist. To see a lot of young people who are really interested in being useful for God is inspiring to me. This has also been a wonderful opportunity to network with others. Rakuba says it's up to these young professionals to instill biblical values into their societies. Only then will they see lasting change. Even though Islam is the dominant religion and the radical Islam is becoming more influential here, I am so blessed to witness the courage and confidence demonstrated by young Christians in Central Asia. George Thomas, CBN News, Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Up next, a funny song about student loan debt put him in the spotlight. And today he's using the attention to share the gospel. See our interview with D1 when we return. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. You may have seen the viral video Sally Maybach online. It's a song that put D1, a rapper from New Orleans, in the national spotlight. But now he's using that attention to bring glory to God. Ephraim Graham has the story. I look a man in his eyes, he ain't nothing to me. I see the spirit in that man, now that's something to see. D1 is a rapidly rising recording artist, but the fame isn't going to his head. Check out his ride around town when he's at home in New Orleans, a nearly 20-year-old car with more than 250,000 miles on it. Are you still driving the 98 Honda? Oh, you know about it. <laughs> oh, I am definitely still driving my 98 Honda. I love it. I love it. I love it. Did you fix the gear? Yeah, so, yeah, because I couldn't go anywhere, man. When the gear broke, I was like, oh, goodness, I can't even, you know, I, I can't even literally put it in park at the moment. I rigged it up so I could go to church that morning because, you know, I was about to skip church, man. And go to the studio. Go to the studio. And I learned my lesson ASAP. So, yes, I'm still driving the 98 Honda. It is it's symbolic of my journey. I was driving it when I was a middle school math teacher a few years ago. And I was telling my students, it's not about your material possessions. It's about the content of your character. It's not about what I drive. It's about what am I rapping about that's influencing people to fulfill their God-given purpose in life. Now that I have achieved some success in the hip-hop industry, 
That car has been loyal to me the whole time. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna be loyal to you. I'm gonna keep you. <laughs> How many miles on that thing? Right now it's about 280, about 280,000. Yeah. That's an ad for Honda, don't you think? Yo, <laughs> yo, hint, hint, plug, plug. Yes, definitely. He was born David Augustine Jr. and he became D1 the rapper in 2005 in college following a flood of natural disasters and real life disappointments. Hip hop was just a hobby. I was bored, so my boys and I, we would, we would just freestyle in the dorm room, but that's the same year that um, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. That's the same year that I went from being the high school star on the basketball team to getting cut when I started college. You know, so my ego was real big. I'm the man in high school, I get cut. That's the same year that my girlfriend, who I had been with since 10th grade, you know, cheated on me when we went to college and, and we broke up, you know. That's the same year that one of my best friends in New Orleans, who I grew up with from five years old, got murdered in the neighborhood that we grew up in. All of this stuff happened. That's what inspired me to want to express all of these emotions I was feeling through hip hop. Started paying them loans back one at a time. Got them down, 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 till I paid them all off. Peace sign. D1 touched the emotions of many people in America with this hit, Sally Maybach, a song inspired by the freedom he felt after finally paying off his student loans. I finished paying Sally Maybach, Maybach. I finished paying Sally Maybach. Did you ever think that a song about student debt would be something that would catapult you to, to such popularity? Honestly, I knew it would. I was 100% confident. Let me explain. It's not about the music I make. I've been making awesome songs. Honestly, you could just YouTube me. You know, I've been making great songs. Yeah, um, it was about the timing. See, God has revealed to me that he has placed me on this earth and in this industry to, to glorify him, to be a light, to be a bridge. People are looking at this interview right now and they're looking at me and they're like, where does this guy come from? What does he do? But when they hear what comes out of my mouth, they're like, wow, he's inspired by something other than what this world can offer you. And that's true. I'm inspired by, by God's you know, blessing of life to me. With that being said, I've been knowing that he has a platform that's way larger than what I currently have waiting for me. But I also knew that God wouldn't elevate me to that platform until my walk was like as pure as I could humanly make it. Because why, why elevate me and give me a platform if I'm only going to embarrass him once I get there? In terms of, of your walk, you have made some real conscious decisions and to, to, be, to talk about. One is your decision to be not just celibate, right. but pure. Yes, it's a difference. Mm -hmm. It's a difference. A lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. There's these levels of Christianity, all right? Man, I have such an awesome story that just happened in New York. I'm doing a, I'm doing a radio interview on a high profile radio station, mainstream radio station, high profile DJ. And he's like, I guess he heard about that as well, about me you know, being celibate. So he asked me, he's like, man, so you mean to tell me that if you meet a fine girl in the lobby right now that you wouldn't be trying to take her up to your room and you know and 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 have sex with her and i'm like i said bro i said when i signed up for this christian walk it's equivalent to you getting a job at this radio station and if there's a if there's a set of ethics and standards that you all should be striving to abide by what if you just pick a couple of them off of that list let's say there's 10 of them you know and you say I'm just not gonna follow this one. I'm not gonna follow this one. Number two and number seven, nah, I'm just not even trying to do those. Then you aren't, you aren't fully signing up you know, for that job. And, and who are you to, to say that you want to be a part of this organization, but you don't wanna try your best to adhere to everything that comes along with it? For me, that's how I view sexual purity. You know, if you're not married, we, we have these levels, man, to where some people say, well, look, I'm not sleeping with that many people outside of marriage. So look, I'm comparing myself to these other people and they're way worse than me. That's where we mess up. We compare ourselves to other people who we shouldn't be comparing ourselves to. You have other people who say, well, I am not having sex at all outside of marriage, but that doesn't mean that I don't watch porn. That doesn't mean that masturbation isn't a part of my life. You know, once again, 
what are you, who are you comparing yourself to? And I just got to that point where I was like, I'm not asking God for any um, half-hearted blessings. I'm not asking God to, to just listen to my prayers 80% of the time. So why should I try to adhere to 80% of his rules? You know what I mean? And I'm just on that mission. Shouldn't we be striving to be more like Jesus? And wasn't he perfect? You know? <laughs> yeah. So so we're not gonna be perfect, but at least striving for it, that's what gets me excited every day. That's what gets me excited every interview. It's like, oh, I got work to do, because I know I'm not perfect, but man, I'm trying. And when I mess up, you know, I think my biggest thing is not getting too down on myself. Because um, if I mess up in any area of my life, I'm really disappointed. I'm really sensitive to my uh, to my flaws. But know? that's where grace comes in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> that's yes, where sir. grace comes yes, sir. in. Yes, sir. You are always ready to 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 rhyme. I understand. Yes. You are. Yeah. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> so before I let you go, I want you to spit something for me. All right. All right. Straight up. You got it. All right. You t <laughs> all right. Look. Um, be real. Be righteous. Be relevant. Throw your threes up. D1 gonna represent. Look, ever since Mike Brown shot, if you still rapping about killing folks, you just as bad as the cops. I be building with children, nothing but gems when I'm spitting. And tell them just cause they alive, that don't mean that they living. I'm Martin Luther King, Tupac, and Detroit Red. But all the girls say I look like Chris Brown with dreads. Man. <laughs> No, you don't know nobody like me. Middle school teacher turned rap star. That ain't like Lee. It's my season. And before this, God held me back for a reason, because I was battling demons. Now they out my system, so I'm back to having fun. The barber shop saying, who better, Cole Kendrick or D1? Huh. I fear God, not no wacky Illuminati. So till I'm married, no sex. It's time to purify my body. And there you have it, rapper D1 on fire for God. What a great story, what an inspiration. We'll be right back. CBN in Europe celebrated Easter in the UK with families at a special screening of Superbook. The event took place at a local theater, screening the episodes called Peter's Denial and He is Risen. It was so popular that it sold out. Families from all over came to watch the episodes, meet Gizmo, dance to the Salvation poem, play games, and win prizes. Each child was also able to leave with their own copy of the episode of Peter's Denial after learning about Jesus' death, resurrection, and the life-changing forgiveness he offers. That's wonderful. And that's it for now on CBN Newswatch. Have a great day.